Now, all of that leads us to Gary Stein, who served on the New Jersey Supreme Court for over 17 years. That's one of the longest tenures of any justice in state history. Justice Stein, welcome to the program. We, we see uh, the governor fighting back in very strong words, and his administration apparently not at all happy about this COA ruling. And I wonder, is some of his complaints center around what he sees as the uh, a liberal court, as he puts it, uh, out of control and taking power away from him. You were there when the housing laws were decided and the court ruled on these issues. What do you think about all that? Well, I think the criticism of Chief Justice Rabner's decision uh, can't be characterized as liberal or activist. I've read his opinion. It's a very scholarly, constrained uh, opinion that interprets the Reorganization Act passed by the legislature. And what he said was that COA simply is not an agency that was subject to reorganization. Uh, and he based that on the legislative language in a very narrow scholarly opinion. So it's not a policy-oriented opinion at all. It's a scholarly judicial opinion. He did what he was supposed to do, interpret the law. But I can tell you this, mm -hmm. I was on the court when the Fair Housing Act that created COA was passed. And at that time, there were three Mount Laurel judges divided uh, throughout the state who were charged with the responsibility for deciding fair housing cases. And our court took all of those cases when, when the Fair Housing Act was passed and transferred them to COA because we were satisfied that COA would be an independent agency. So the notion that COA could be dissolved and its functions transferred to the Department of Community Affairs simply isn't consistent with what we would would have required back in 1987. The flip side of that in terms of the governor's reaction to a Supreme Court ruling came in the Harvey Cedars case, where the court basically sided with the administration's point of view, which is that, that the, the local government and local governments up and down the shore will not have to pay substantial amounts of money for these easement rights. Uh, is that groundbreaking in, in that ruling? Well, I haven't read Justice Albin's opinion, but I think there's a larger point, and that is that governors uh, ought to understand that when they criticize judicial opinions too often and too publicly and personalize the criticism, they run the risk of politicizing the judiciary. And one of the great strengths of New Jersey's judiciary since the 1947 Constitution was its independence and its insulation from politics. And that may not be a popular issue uh, at election time, but it's a very important institutional value for New Jersey. The importance of an independent judiciary was regarded by Governor Driscoll back in the 40s as the most important reason for the new Constitution. And so I um, worry about uh, comments that threaten the independence of New Jersey's judiciary. You've also spoken about, about your concerns uh, about a recent Supreme Court decision, U.S. Supreme Court decision, on the subject of the Voting Rights Act and how it basically said that much of that act is old law, obsolete law, and that many of the states that were being governed by it, New Jersey not being one of them as I understand it, uh, no longer have to adhere to it. What, what troubled you about that decision? Well, I think that the historic roots of the Voting Rights Act um, color a lot of people's views about the Supreme Court's recent decision in validating the act. Back in 1965, a group of African-American voting rights activists were marching from Selma, Alabama to Montgomery. And as they were crossing the Edmund Pettus Bridge outside of Selma, um, they were beaten by Alabama state troopers and vigilantes and local police. And the beating was captured on national television, and the result was that President Johnson went to Congress and called for the passage of a Voting Rights Act that once and for all would stop the southern states from depriving African Americans of the right to vote. So there's a very emotional attachment on the part of many 
civil rights activists to the Voting Rights Act. Uh, the actual issue that the Supreme Court decided is a little more arcane. The act was passed in 1965, reauthorized in 1970, uh, reau reauthorized again in 1982, and then reauthorized in 2006. But the formula that determined which states were subject to it was based on a 1972 formula. And the question was which states didn't have 50% voting participation and which states used a literacy test or a poll tax to decide who could vote. What the Supreme Court said last week was that when Congress reauthorized the law in 2006, it was not justifiable to use the 1972 standard. And Chief Justice Roberts, who wrote the opinion for a five-member majority, said there should be current justification for making these southern states and other counties subject to the preclearance law. The dissent by Justice Ginsburg took another tack and said, no, that's not the question. The question is whether Congress was justified in concluding that those states continue to discriminate. And if Congress was satisfied with that, the court should defer. I think Justice Ginsburg had the better of the argument, but it's not cut and dried, and you could make a respectable argument either way, depending on how you frame the issue. There are also very strong emotions about another U.S. Supreme Court decision, which does suddenly find itself in the forefront of headlines here in New Jersey. The Defense of Marriage Act being struck down, marriage equality now becoming a huge issue here in this state, in the gubernatorial campaign, and before the court as well. You, your opinions about, about this as law and about its ability to, uh, to stand the law as it exists in New Jersey, this, the test of not only time, but of, of politics right now. Sure. Well, I wouldn't express a view on what's going to happen with the pending litigation because I read that there's a motion just filed challenging the New Jersey law on the basis that New Jersey same-sex couples don't enjoy the benefits granted by federal law now that the Supreme Court has invalidated the Defense of Marriage Act. But I will say this, uh, it's remarkable how public opinion on this issue has evolved over the last decade. And when the New Jersey Supreme Court had the issue, the court in effect said, well, we're not satisfied that it's evolved enough yet. We're going to insist on equality for same-sex couples, equal rights, but we're not going to say that a prohibition on same-sex marriage is unconstitutional. I think public opinion perhaps has overtaken that point of view, so it'll be interesting to see how the judicial branch deals with this. But I think the Supreme Court's opinion on the Defense of Marriage Act was eminently correct, and I suspect it's just a matter of time. There has been all sorts of debate about vacancies on the state Supreme Court, about candidates to fill those vacancies, about the political process not being able to agree to, to vote them in. And so I ask you, in your opinion, has the work of the court been affected by that? Well, it's hard to answer that because I'm no longer there. I left the court in September 2002. But I can tell you from past experience that there were many occasions during my tenure when we didn't have a full complement of justices, either because of illness or disqualification. And when we had less than seven justices uh, assigned to an important case, uh, it did uh, impede the effectiveness of our deliberations and decisional process. So I think the court uh, needs the full seven justices. I think it's important for the Senate to sooner rather than later give the governor an up and down, up or down vote on these two pending nominees. And I think the New Jersey Supreme Court, if it's to function, 
the way the legislature and the framers of the 47 Constitution intended needs to have seven justices um, serving on that court who don't have to look over their shoulder and worry about uh, whether their decisions meet somebody's political standards. Are you worried about the impact of politics on the work of the court? I'm very much worried. Uh, the fact that Justice Wallace was denied tenure was, in my view, uh, an enormous mistake. And I think it caused not only justices on the court, but judges throughout the judicial system to begin to think about their jobs in another way. You know, judges in New Jersey are appointed initially for seven years, and after seven years, they're reappointed until age 70. Once you go on the bench uh, and give up your law practice, it's a very disconcerting prospect to think that after seven years, you might not be reappointed, and you might have to go back and pick up the pieces of your law practice. So understandably, judges who are on the bench who think that their reappointment might be affected by whether their decisions are viewed uh, with approval or disapproval by the governor's office uh, may be looking over their shoulder. That's a and disturbing notion to consider. It is a very disturbing notion. I can only tell you that in the 18, almost 18 years I served, that was never a consideration, never. Did Time, any, times were different, things have changed. Time, times were different, and never did we worry about whether, in fact, the court I served on reversed 30 death sentences in a row. I wrote the first opinion for our court affirming a death sentence in the Robert Marshall case. And if any one of us had to face uh, either a popular vote or a tenure reappointment while we were reversing 30 consecutive death sentences, it would have been very tough. But never did we worry that we were going to be faced with a political consequence for our decisions. And you think some of those who have followed in your footsteps do worry? I don't know, but it wouldn't surprise me. Justice Stein, thank you for coming in, sir. My pleasure.